All right, everybody. So let's go ahead and let's talk about some disc herniations and how those are going to show up on images. Remember that with any sort of soft tissue, x-ray is probably not going to be our best choice. Obviously, we have seen some soft tissue that can be seen via radiograph, such as like a cardiac shadow and things of that nature. Um, but when it comes to the intervertebral discs, we really probably need to do an MRI. Um, CT scan can be another good option, but MRI is a a fantastic option as well. So typically a disc herniation is going to be degenerative. We're going to go over some signs and symptoms that you're going to see on imaging. That's going to show you if a disc herniation is more chronic or degenerative than it is traumatic. Typically where we're going to see most of these are going to be L4, L5, L5, S1. Obviously there's no more weight bearing components of the spine. And typically, if we see a disc herniation that is anteriorly displaced, or if it's intravertebral, meaning that it's kind of pushed through a bone, ooh, that person needs to go get seen right now. Obviously, the anterior longitudinal ligament is a lot stronger than the posterior longitudinal ligament. And if our disc is pushing through bone tissue, that's a bad, bad sign. We're going to go over a couple um different diagnoses where we're actually going to see something like that happen if it's a posterior intraspinal herniation sometimes we can see low back pain obviously you can see radicular symptoms as well so when we're looking at disc herniations typically we don't want to do any imaging for four to six weeks after the onset of symptoms why because the vast majority of people are going to improve with conservative treatment there's a large number of people that have a, quote, herniated disc on an image, but they're asymptomatic. Actually, back one study I saw said up to 90% of the asymptomatic population has an abnormal finding on an MRI. Here's the problem. Imaging may demonstrate incidental findings not related to the acute episode, or it can instigate premature surgical consults or invasive or unnecessary care. I have seen this many, many times in my career. The saying is treat the patient, not the picture. And that's something we really need to be wary of, right? Because these folks are going to go access imaging. They're going to come into our office and they're going to say, hey, I have three levels of lumbar disc herniations. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Well, it's very possible they were there for years and the person never knew it until they went and got that image. Just because something shows up on an image does not necessarily mean that is what's causing their symptoms. So this is a fun little picture kind of showing you the difference between a disc protrusion and an extrusion. We're going to see a couple other images on MRI as well, but that's just kind of a precursor. When we're looking at the difference between protrusion and extrusion, extrusions, excuse me, that is going to be very valuable information. Typically, we're going to see protrusions in our asymptomatic population. Extrusions are very uncommon in an asymptomatic population. Said differently, when you see an extrusion, that's probably symptomatic, right? You can take a pretty good bet, a pretty good guess that that extruded tissue is causing symptoms. So just be very, very careful when you're looking at these MRIs that we kind of differentiate what's a prolapsed tissue versus an extruded tissue. So this is a nice little sagittal picture of MRI. This is, quote, normal. Now, first thing we need to look at is this, is this a T1 or T2 MRI? What you probably should recognize is that the cerebral spinal fluid is showing up bright. Therefore, this is a T2 MRI. As we can see that darkened tissue inside that bright tissue, that is the clonus medullaris, phylum terminale, and the cauda equina. So you kind of get a really nice picture here of how that cauda equina actually appears. It almost appears like a horse's tail, right? That's, what, that's why it's called the cauda equina. What we see here and what we're going to look for is draw those little lines, right? Those 
anterior, middle, and posterior lines we talked about last week. Is there any disc that is encroaching into what we call the thecal sac or into that white space where there's cerebral spinal fluid? That's going to be the big thing that we're going to look at when it comes to disc herniations. This is a coronal image. So what we're seeing here is we're going to see basically a cross section. OK, there's a couple different tissues we're going to see here. Now, really, really big point to note here is that vertebral body is going to show up kind of like every other bone shows up on an MRI. We can kind of see it, doesn't look so great. The really interesting thing with this picture is that number two. Right, so what we can see is we can see all the bright white cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so this is it's still a T2 MRI. But all those little black dots in there, those are all the fibers of the cauda equina. Okay, so you get a really nice view here. These are abnormal MRIs. Okay, so what I want you to note here Take a look at the far left hand side of the screen. That is a prolapsed disc. OK, so the disc is pushing backwards or posteriorly into the thecal sac. We can see some encroachment of that black or dark tissue into the white cerebral spinal fluid. Take a look at the middle picture and you, you don't get a really defined bubble like you do on the left hand side. So what that means is that that disc tissue has been extruded, okay? So it's kind of squirting out, for lack of a better term, into that spinal canal. Taking a look at the far right-hand side of the screen, what we see is you can actually see the disc pushing into the cerebral spinal fluid. So you can actually see that fecal sac getting pushed laterally and getting pushed posteriorly with that picture. So very interesting pictures, in my opinion. Take a look at this picture. OK, this is another T2 MRI. What we can see here about one level above the reference line is one very, very minor disc herniation. OK, so. This is kind of the issue. That is considered a disc herniation that will show up on a report as a disc herniation. What we see, though, is that it's not really pushing or infecting or affecting any sort of the spinal canal or the spinal cord. But this is why we need to be very careful with reports, and this is why we need to be very careful with images, is that not all disc herniations are the same. Some are going to be very, very bad. Some are going to be very, very minor. This happens to be a very minor one. Now, taking a look at this image, what we can see here is you know, obviously kind of the gray scale on the left hand side. And then this MRI in particular was able to colorize. OK, so it actually gives you a much different representation. What we can see here is an extruded disc. OK, so we can see that disc tissue kind of leaking right out into the spinal canal. And you can actually see that dark space of that disc just about touching the cauda equina. Take a look at the colored pictures, especially in the bottom right hand corner picture. You can actually see that disc tissue, kind of that nucleus propulsus leaking out, right? So the annulus fibrosus has been completely torn, and nucleus propulsus has kind of shot out into the uh, spinal canal. This is a picture of an annular tear. Okay, so what an annular tear is, it kind of says what it is, is what it says, right? So it is a tear of the annulus fibrosis. Understand that that is going to be a very different diagnosis, very different set of symptoms, very different clinical presentation than a disc herniation. So what's happened here is that obviously we have a tear in the annulus fibrosis. That's caused some inflammation within the annulus fibrosis itself, and that inflammation shows up as a bright white spot, right? So we don't see a lot of disc tissue pushing back into the spinal canal. But what we do see is we see this little bright spot right where the annulus fibrosis is. Now, could this turn into something like an extruded disc if the annulus completely fails and, and ruptures? Absolutely, it can. Is it likely? 
I have no idea, right? And that's kind of, you know, kind of one of those things time will tell. But what we do know is we do have some tearing of that annulus fibrosis. This is a Schmorl's note, okay? And this is what I kind of reference with those intravertebral defects. This is an interesting one because what's happened here is that the vertebral body and the bone and the calcium matrix of the vertebral body has gotten so weak that the disc tissue has more pressure in it and more substance than the actual bone. Because the bone cannot push back against the force of the disc tissue, the disc tissue starts to push up against and down against the vertebral bodies. So what you actually have is they almost look like little cavities in teeth, right? So you have these kind of large pits that happen within the vertebral body. This is a bad situation, right? Because what, literally what that means is that the actual cancellous bone of the vertebral body is so weak that it cannot hold up to the pressure of soft tissue. That is a problem. Here's a couple more pictures of Schmorl's nodes. Again, these are very bad findings. You don't want to have these. Um, usually your patient's going to need some pretty significant, um, obviously physical therapy, what we do, and pretty significant calcium supplementation and potential vertebral plasty if it's bad enough. So really with the kind of the clinical pearl here is when we look at MRI as a predictor of surgical outcome, what we need to see, and I, I tell folks this a lot, if you can show me the exact spot on an MRI where the disc or the bone or the spinal cord is being affected and your symptoms match up completely, then that's probably the problem. Those are the folks that have really good surgical outcomes where the thecal sac has been compromised or compressed greater than one third of its original space, that's a pretty big compromise. If there's nerve root compression or nerve root displacement, obviously the surgeon can go right in, fix it, the person goes on with their life. Typically where we see outcomes not so good are with our smaller herniations, if there's minimal to no nerve root impingement or minimal end plate changes. And we're gonna talk about end plate changes here in just a little bit. These are the folks that, to be quite honest with you, probably that herniation wasn't causing the problem in the first place. And the rigor of the surgery, right? The invasiveness of the surgery, because it's, it's a tough surgery. Actually, I won't say caused more damage, but it affected that patient in a negative way versus not doing any intervention. So we're gonna go over some degenerative conditions next. So subcategories of degeneration, typically what we're gonna see is we're gonna see either a spondylosis deformance. Typically what that means is that it, we could have some normal changes from aging, it's typically going to affect the annulus fibrosis, and it's typically going to affect the anterior and lateral apophyseal osteophytes, right? With spondylosis deformans, we're going to have a normal disc height, okay? So the disc is not going to change height at all. With an intervertebral chondrosis, however, this is actually going to have some vertebral body reactive changes. This is where we're going to see disc space narrowing, right? So you might see that on a report that they had a narrow disc space. You might actually see something called a vacuum phenomenon, and that's where the disc kind of sucks back in on itself. And that's kind of an interesting finding as well. Or we could have canal stenosis. Now, with radiology characteristics, and this is one of the big issues that we see, is we have the word disease attached to a lot of this stuff, right? So obviously, when we hear the word disease, we think a couple of things. Number one, uh-oh, that's bad, right? Number two, 
it's irreversible, it's progressive, it's going to get worse, there's no hope for it. That's not the case, right? So with degenerative disc disease, just like degenerative joint disease that we see in our shoulders and knees and stuff, a lot of it is the result of the aging process. Typically, what degenerative disc disease means, or you'll see DDD on a report, is decreased disc space. When we see DJD of the spine, or sometimes what's called osteoarthritis of the spine, typically what that is referring to is facet joint narrowing and some sclerosis, right? So sclerosis being, we can see that kind of bright white edge around the bone, meaning that there's some wear and tear. If we see spondylosis, spondylosis typically means end plate spurring. Okay, and when we see end plate spurring or large bone spurs happening at the end plates, and the end plate is essentially the interface between the disc and the vertebral body. Okay, so that's what an end plate is. And what you'll see is you actually see these end plates kind of come out to almost like a little spike or a little spur. That tells us that there is a degenerative process going on as opposed to a very acute process. And that's going to be a very big difference when we start looking at some of these images. And then there's something called a dish, which is a diffuse idiopathic spinal hyperstosis. And essentially what that means is that there is more than four connected segments. Okay, so that means that four vertebral bodies have fused together. So here's a degenerative disc on an MRI. So what we can see here is that not only do we have a herniation happening here, but we literally can see a decrease in the height of the disc versus the other discs that are on the picture. This is a picture of spondylosis. So I mentioned those osteophytes or that end plate spurring. That's what I mean. Okay, so there's been some wear and tear. The anterior longitudinal ligament and the disc interface has kind of pulled against the bone of the vertebral body. The vertebral body itself has started to reform a little bit to react to some of those changes, right? So just like regular arthritis. And when we see this, what we need to do is we need to say, okay, that is a degenerative change. Okay, so that's not an acute problem. That's a degenerative change. So a stenosis, there's a couple different types of stenosis. There are some folks out there that just have congenital stenosis, right? They're just kind of born with it. It's part of the genetic makeup. There are some folks who have acquired stenosis. So basically what acquired stenosis is, is degeneration. So they either have that kind of degenerative disc disease, a spondylosis, maybe ligament of flavum hypertrophied, facet joints hypertrophied, something like that. And there are some cases where we have a little bit of both. Right, we, I, There are some folks out there that they have a little bit of congenital problem, but then because of their lifestyle, because of occupation, because of positions they're in, they actually contribute to it as well. So essentially what stenosis is, is you're going to see it defined as a lateral recess, which means that there is an encroachment into the lateral side, a central canal stenosis, or a little bit of both. So 25% of the asymptomatic population under the age of 40 has some stenosis. Okay, that's really important to know because we're going to see folks that come in that are 28, 29, 30, 31 years old, and they're going to say, holy cow, I have stenosis. Well, they may have already had it or may have always had it because they kind of fall into that congenital makeup. The other thing to note here is everyone – just about everybody over the age of 60 is going to show some stenosis too. And we're going to see this a lot. We're going to see a lot of folks that come in, they're 64, 65 years old, and they say, holy cow, I have stenosis. Well, I hate to break it to you, but everyone you went to high school with does too. So what we need to do is we need to educate our patient that that's actually kind of a normal finding and we need to work through it. Typically, the normal a to P diameter, anterior to posterior diameter of the lumbar spinal canal 
should be anywhere from 15 to 27 millimeters. If it's less than that, then that's going to be considered to be stenotic or stenotic, uh, stenosis. Typically, if it's mild, someone might have some low back pain, numbness, weakness in lower extremities. If it's super bad, then we're dealing with cauda equina syndrome. Obviously, saddle paresthesia, bowel bladder problems, things of that nature. So common combination of degenerative processes here. We could have a little bit of everything, right? So I've seen some folks where they got some DDD going on, they got some osteophytes going on, they got DJD going on, they have you know a little bit of everything. So what we can see a lot of times is that folks are going to have these stacked diagnoses. All of these diagnoses are because of the aging process, right? So that's the other thing we're going to see on a lot of times these radiologist reports. They'll bullet point or list out four, five, six different diagnoses that literally are all related to the aging process. We need to educate our patients that it's going to be okay, right? We need to work, kind of work through this. You obviously can do some stuff, and this is not a progressive disease. So here's radiograph, obviously, on the left-hand side of the screen, MRI on the right-hand side of the screen, looking at stenosis, all right? So what we see here is you can see that posterior, inferior aspect of the vertebral body kind of encroaching, for lack of a better term, into the intervertebral canal. You could imagine that there's probably going to be a little bit of spinal, not spinal cord, but spinal nerve irritation here. There could be, there could not be, right? It kind of depends on the patient. Right hand side of the screen, obviously, we see that same picture on an MRI. And what we can see is not only do we have that end plate spurring, but we also have a disc herniation as well that is actually pushing in onto the spinal cord. So here's caught Aquinas syndrome. Obviously, we've talked about this one. What we see here is a massively extruded disc, and it's pushing in, obviously, on the cauda equina, causing things like subtle anesthesia, bowel bladder changes, paresthesia is going down bilateral lower extremities. This is an interesting one. So this is actually what spina bifida can look like on radiograph. Obviously, what we see here is we see an incomplete fusion of the posterior arch of one of the vertebrae or sometimes multiple vertebrae. And the really interesting thing here is that there's actually quite the high incidence of it. So there's a lot more people walking around with this that don't even know they have it. And it's kind of debatable on how clinically significant it really is. And the reason it, it's debatable is because so many people are out there who have it, who don't know they have it until they have an x-ray done. Now, I'm going to go over a couple pictures of the SI joint. We're going to cover the SI joint a little more next week as well. This is typically what the basic projections of the SI joint are going to look like. Okay, so we're typically going to do an AP axial. And we're going to do right and left obliques. This is what the AP axle looks like. Obviously, we can see a nice picture of the sacrum here. We can see both of the articulations between the sacrum and the ilium as well. This is typically what the oblique view is going to look like. We're going to get one from the right side, obviously get one from the left side as well. When it comes to pathology of the SIJ, Typically, what we're going to see here, the big one we're going to cover today is going to be ankylosing spondylitis. The reason I want to cover it here is because it actually relates more to the lumbar spine than it does to the SI joint. This is what ankylosing spondylitis is going to look like. Now, the layman's term you're going to hear, okay, you're going to hear bamboo spine, because if you actually look at the vertebrae, it actually looks like a piece of bamboo. The other term you're going to hear is sacralization, okay? And sacralization literally means that that last L5 lumbar vertebrae has fused to the sacrum. So it has sacroiliacs. This is typically what sacralization is going to look like, okay? So what we're going to have is that the, actually the transverse processes of L5 are going to grow 
okay, as scary as that sounds. They're going to grow, and then they're actually going to fuse into the PSIS, is right, those posterior superior iliac spines. And this is where we have a lot of the growth happen. So literally, we have bone, kind of unchecked bone growth. It fuses into the bones that ends up touching. And this is a great sign that somebody is going to have or is having ankylosing spondylitis. Obviously, what we're going to do here is we are going to map that onto our modified New York criteria. Okay, so make sure you review that modified New York criteria as well. And other than that, I will see everybody next week.